Wednesday. Yes, it is Wednesday. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in now and in the future. YouTube, what's going on? What's the deal? Hello, 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 no, 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 no. Yes, I came in with some LaShawn Pace from way back in the day. I know I've been changed. Yes, yes, yes. So I hope you're having a good week so far. Today we are going to talk about the classic picture of a narcissist incubator. Okay, in case you don't know that term, incubator. You know what an incubator is, right? It's uh, basically like a box or a glass thing or a plastic thing that keeps eggs warm, that keeps um, baby animals warm. I my friend has an animal rescue, and she has lots of incubators. And um, it keeps the little squirrels and little baby possums that don't have a mother. You know, maybe the possum mother was run over or poisoned, or squirrel was poisoned or whatever, or eaten by a coyote, and the remaining babies need warmth. So that's where we put incubators. Incubators are impersonal. All they provide is the basic necessities. Okay, they do not provide anything beyond the survival necessities of, you know, warmth and not even, you know, incubators like real um, incubators, they don't even have food that they provide. They don't provide any nurture or emotional care or any kind of safety or security. It's just plain incubator. It's impersonal. It's a, uh, a non-living thing, right? So that's why we call narcissistic uh, women who have given birth to children. We either call them 
Uh, multiparas, which is a medical term for a female that has given multiple pers, uh, births, or we call them incubators, okay? All right, so now that we've cleared that out, uh, we also might uh, touch on uh, a couple of true crime cases, you know, so um, if I get around to it. Anyway, um, hmm. I have to take a little pause because I'm about to share with you something very, very personal in regards to this topic of narcissistic parents, toxic parents, toxic family dynamics, and things of that nature, mental health, right? Mental health, it's such an important thing. I have uh, talked about Dr. Ramani and uh, some other people, um, mental health professionals on YouTube that have lots and lots of resources and information on this topic, on this very topic. Whew, all right. Um, it's a lot to process, folks, but I figured I'd do a video because I think it's important to put, put that out there. And I think it's important for me to verbalize this, you know, um, I do have a really, really great support system. I can't thank my, my friends and family enough for really, really being there for me and making space for me. You know, that means the world to me. And to validate me and acknowledge me in this way, you know, that's what friends do for each other. And, you know, they say blood is thicker than water. But I think it's just a saying. It may be true in some cases, but it isn't a guarantee. It is not a guarantee. It is not an automatic thing by no means. Uh, just because a mother gives birth to a child does not mean that she loves that child, does not mean that she wants that child. It does not mean she even has a connection with that child. And uh, this is often seen with uh, women who have, um, is it called reactive, what is it called, RAD, attachment, oh, RAD, attachment disorder, what is it, reactive attachment disorder, yes, R-A-D, reactive attachment disorder, is often seen in Children and, of course, adults who have been adopted, who did not have a steady caretaker in their early childhood years. And when they develop this reactive attachment disorder, they don't have the ability to form normal, healthy bonds and attachments with people as adults a lot of times. And a lot of times they do, not always, this isn't, you know, there are always exceptions, but there is a general predisposition towards a personality disorder uh, in the antisocial personality disorder cluster, which includes narcissism, sociopathy, psychopathy, borderline personality disorder, and histrionic, and a couple of other in that dark cluster, right? So, here we go. As, uh, as some of you know, in the past couple of years, I have been actively doing genealogy research into my family tree, into my ancestries, uh, finding out I've got uh, a, quite a bit of ethnicities in my DNA. And... Um, in, in, in the process of that, I have been in contact with several different government agencies from my hometown where I was born in Germany. We call it the um, Standesamt, okay, and um, a couple of other uh, government agencies. And in the process of getting all kinds of records, I decided to contact, um, well, how can I put this? I was speaking to an official at one of the agencies about a totally different thing. I, I was uh, researching 
my uh, great, great, great grandparents on my maternal bio, uh, maternal, maternal side of the family tree. And um, we got to talking and I got the bright idea, be careful what you go digging for, by the way, because you just might find something. I got the bright idea to request uh, some records from my childhood, from where I was born, and um, also to contact um, the Youth Authority. We call it um, Jugendamt and a couple of other names. And it is uh, similar. They're all under that conglomerate of child protective services, child welfare. Here in America, we call it CPS or Child Protective Services. It's a different name there. We call it Jugendamt and a couple of other names, but it's basically the, the same principle, right? All right. So... I have gotten some, some documents sent to me in the mail, some records from the CPS there in Germany. And um, I am, wow, I am really, really, wow, wow. In a nutshell, CPS wanted to take me away from the woman who gave birth to me within the first year of me being born. And the reason was, among other things, here in the papers, because she had left me by myself as an infant for many, many hours of the day alone probably was going to work and just leaving her newborn infant there alone. And also it says that she did not know how to care for me. She didn't know how to make a bottle. She didn't care to bother to find out how to feed her newborn baby. And it says that she threatened the uh, caseworker that came out I don't know how many times they came out, how many times CPS was called on her. Uh, but the caseworker that came out documented that the incubator that gave birth to me threatened to, to jump out, to take me and jump out of uh, a window and basically kill herself and me, you know, murder, suicide, if they want, if they, if they try to take me away from her. So, I am processing that. I am. And you know what the, the, the crazy thing about it is? Is that she herself told me this ever since. This was one of these other things that she constantly would tell me as a, as a little kid. I remember being three and four years old and her telling me these things. Um... I remember in first grade, um, that year when I started first grade, it was just constantly her talking about this, saying that her adoptive mother would call CPS on her and try to get me taken away. And she basically told me everything except the reason, the reason was different than what it says in the documents here. She made it seem like it was a vindictive vendetta from her adoptive mother to call CPS on her and to try to get me taken away. And she said, now imagine I'm like this four year old kid, you know, four or five year old kid She's telling me this. She's saying your grandmother called um, CPS when you shortly after you were born and tried to get you taken away. And, you know, it's because she was a vindictive and, you know, all because I just happened to tell her that I didn't know how to make a baby bottle. And, you know, they blew it out of proportion. And of course, I'm a little kid. You know, you're a little kid. You're going to take the side of your mom. 
right? You're going to see it how mom sees it because you are too young to even have your own individual identity yet. So, uh, yeah. Now, documentation with the CPS says the reason that they wanted to take me was because she was leaving me alone for many hours, an infant. Now, I have a question about this. First of all, uh, and, and mind you, she told me this too. She told me herself that she threatened the CPS worker that if they tried to take me away from her, she was going to take me and jump out of a window with me and kill her, me and herself. Okay, murder, suicide. So you mean to tell me you care so much about this child that you're willing to, to jump out of the window, you know, you don't want CPS to take your child because you care and love this child so much, but you didn't even bother to learn how to make a baby bottle? You know how to make a bottle for a baby? Like, is it that hard? Is it that complex? Because people, hell, when people get a hermit crab, okay, a fucking hermit crab, you know, they ask wherever they get it from at the pet store, okay, what do I feed this, this crab? You know what I mean? When people get a dog and a cat, you know, they try to find out how to feed that animal. You know what I mean? When, when people get a rat, a pet rat, they want to know, well, what do I feed this rat? That's like the first goddamn question the first thing you're going to cover is like, okay, you have this new baby, right? Like you carried this child for nine months in your body, a whole child, your own flesh and blood for nine months in your body. And even several months after this child was born, I'm talking about six, seven, eight months. This is almost a year old, and you still didn't bother to, to try to find out how to properly feed this baby? And mind you, she's told me she never breastfed me, okay? Make it make sense. Make it make sense. So check this out. I have seen this woman, as unfortunate as I am to have been born to this incubator, I have seen her put the most care into feeding her saltwater fish. Do you hear me? Saltwater is very expensive. Saltwater aquariums and saltwater fish and even just maintaining them, the food and all that is very, very, very expensive. Okay. And I have seen her go all the way across town to a specialty saltwater aquarium pet store, okay? This isn't Petco or, or Animal or PetSmart. This is someone's private, some rich guy who goes every two weeks on his yacht in Florida and fishes, crab fishes and deep sea fishes to get all of these, these things and makes the food himself specialty. Of course, you know it's going to be expensive, super expensive. But I've seen her go all the way across town every couple of weeks to buy her saltwater fish, the right kinds of food. I've been to that store with her and where the man would explain to her, this kind of fish eats that and the puffer fish, this kind of puffer fish has to have a diet and this and that. And she's all about that. She was all about that. And now I'm thinking back, damn. This hooker done put all this work and time and energy and thought into her saltwater fish and how to properly feed them. And she didn't even bother to figure out how to make a basic baby bottle for her own kid when it, when it was born. So you mean to tell me that that was an act of vindictiveness on her adoptive mother's part? I don't think so. Maybe so. I don't know the lady. But, you know, I think somebody was trying to make sure that I didn't continue to get abused and neglected. But you know how CPS is. You know, these Child Protective Services, they're never, you know, they're hit, they're hit or miss, you know. Um, 
sometimes they, they intervene and help a child, but a lot of times they don't. And I don't, you know, I don't understand why it's just, I mean, we had a case here in LA a couple of years before COVID. And uh, I remember being at the LA Superior Court um, in one of the departments, you know, where I was working. And uh, one of the lawyers was like, have you heard this, this big, huge scandal with CPS out here in LA? And I go, no, what, what happened? Basically, it was a little boy that was killed by his parents and there had been, oh gosh, at least a dozen or so CPS calls made on, on behalf of teachers and CPS even came out and saw had first-hand documentation of the beating, the violence, the abuse, and did not take this kid away from their his horrible parents. I'm talking about dozens and dozens and dozens of calls and visits and documentation of real abuse, and they still did not remove that child. So guess what happened? His parents ended up killing him. Okay, they ended up beating him and beating him and beating him to the till finally, I mean, no one was putting any limits on the beatings or anything. No one was taking him away. So he ended up being killed. And it was a big lawsuit that the, the county was being sued. CPS was being sued. Everybody was being sued. Even the individual workers that came out and did not do their part. Okay did not do their part. I guess the system is overwhelmed with so many abuse of kids getting abused. They don't even know where to put them all. You know what I mean? I tell you, it's some sick sickness out here and you and I are not alone. But uh, in any case, uh, gosh, it's a lot to process. It's a lot to process because it means at least in my case, this incubator has always, since the very beginning, wanted to harm my life. That's not real love. That is not real love when you decide you want to off yourself and you want to make that decision for an, a, a, a newborn child, an innocent child. That's not real. That's not love. That's sick. And that's evil. It's evil. It's nar narcissist. Narcissist. It's all about you and what you want. So you're going to drag this innocent child into your own death. Well, like I said, she herself told me these things many, many times during my childhood. And now looking back, you know, she probably felt a lot of guilt and shame and twisted emotions about herself. You know what I mean? And she needed someone to alleviate her guilt. So she used me, uh, her child, you know, at the time, uh, a, a three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I mean, she told me these things even into my adulthood, you know to brainwash me and to keep giving her relief of her own guilt. Well, guess what? I'm not here to relieve anyone's guilt. That's not my job, nor am I here to dole any guilt and shame out. Not my job either, okay? I'm not here to help anyone to alleviate their guilt, nor am I here to dole out any guilt and shame. That's all on you. Take that shit to Oprah. That's your baggage. That is your unfinished business, not mine. Okay? And you can't lie with these documents here. Like I said, it's nothing that she hasn't told me already. But the reasons now are different because it says right here in black and white, she left me alone, an infant. And I know that's... I know that's the truth because I cannot remember ever having a babysitter. I've always been alone at home. I had to raise myself. You know who raised me? My imaginary friends. No lie. No cap here. My imaginary friends taught me how to put on my shoes, 
how to put on my clothes. My imaginary friends tutored me when I had to come to America and didn't know the language. All I knew was shut up and curse words because that's what all that was told, said to me from the step person. He was the American one. You know, that's the first English word I learned was shut up because that's all he ever told me was to shut up and curse me out and, and beat me. You know, that's all he was ever good for. That's all he knew how to do was talk with his fists. So that's all I learned was shut up and, and, uh, and curse words. Uh, when I came to America, that's all, I, all the vocabulary I knew. And I, my imaginary friends, tutored me and taught me English and taught me how to speak without an accent. Yes, those are my imaginary friends. My imaginary friends helped me through school. Everything that a kid has to go through, I had to go through by myself. And it was my imaginary friends that helped me. They were teachers and professors, okay? Get a load of that. Now, somebody was talking about the limbic system and all that. I looked that up, and that's a very interesting topic we're going to touch on a little bit later this year, uh, how the limbic system is connected to spirituality and how it is the center uh, that heavily influences things like um, religion, um, the feeling of a, of a, a God presence, uh, violent behavior, sexual behavior. So sex, religion, and violence. Now, how many of us can relate to those kinds of backgrounds? You know, I'm talking about cults, you know, with the heavy religion thing, okay? And how there's a lot of, lot, a lot of horrible, horrible violence behind closed doors. Domestic violence child abuse of every sort, including the most depraved, the sexual abuse. So, you know, you have limbic system damage galore. But we'll talk about the limbic system a little later. But folks, you know, uh, <laughs> folks, let me tell you, it is something to really, that I really, really need to process. It is like I said, it's nothing I haven't known before, but all my life I've been told one thing as to the reason, and now in black and white, I see the reason. Because I was being neglected, left alone at home. And I remember waking up as a toddler in the middle of the night, like scared as hell because no one was there. You know, they went out dancing or went out with their friends. She went out with her friends or whatever. And I remember waking up many times in the middle of the night to, to being completely alone in, in the home. You know, I'm talking about four, five, six years old. You know what I mean? And I would turn, I remember I would turn on all, I would turn on all of the lights everywhere because I was afraid of the dark. And here I am, I'm completely alone abandoned and i mean it was so fucking scary excuse my french it was so scary folks you know and i had to go through this over and over i remember being alone at home after school when uh you know when people would follow me there would be some some adult some this man i remember he would keep following me after school and i would be so afraid i had no one to talk to about it you know, no one cared anyway. I mean, anything I, I, you know, when, when the incubator would come home from work, she was tired. She didn't want to be bothered with me. And she would get on the telephone and talk to her friends. And anytime I needed to talk to her, you know, she would yell at me and, and threaten to, to spank me, beat me if I didn't shut up and stay out of her hair. So, you know, uh, I couldn't, I never had a chance to get anybody to help me sort that out as a kid, you know, but it sure was scary. There was several times when I guess there was some adults watching me and, you know, anything could have happened to me because they knew there was no one there to supervise me. There's no adults there around to supervise me, you know? So this right here on this, um, on this document here, the CPS records here, that she left me completely alone for many, many hours during the day as an infant. 
Yeah, I truly know that's true. Because like I told you, I can't ever remember having a babysitter or anybody at home there with me watching me ever. Ever. You hear me? Ever. When you look up latchkey kid, you're going to see my picture in the dictionary. And, um, yeah, so her threatening the CPS worker to commit murder-suicide, that she will take me and jump out of a, a, a window and, and kill herself and me. I mean, she told me this herself. But in her mind, I guess she didn't think it was anything wrong with it. I guess in her mind, she even put it to me as if it was like proof how, of how much she loved me, you know. But it's like... <laughs> How much can you care about some uh, uh, a child when you didn't even bother to figure out how to make a basic baby bottle, you know? And you're 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 so unaware of what you are, your narcissism, that you even tell other people, yeah, well, you know, I don't even know how to make a baby bottle, and they get alarmed and call CPS. You're not alarmed, like what's the problem, you know? And other people are wondering, like, is this child getting fed? Like, is this child being really taken care of? And I think she might have also told them that she leaves me alone at home, like a pet, you know, like a cat or a dog or a bird or something, uh, home alone while she goes to work, you know, save money on babysitter. And that is so her MO, folks. I'm telling you. I mean, I would see her do that with her little dogs that she supposedly loved so much. But when those dogs had some kind of health issues or seemed to be like, the one time the dog was like passed, passed out or something, looking like she was, you know, passing out. And she didn't want to take the dog to the vet because she didn't want to spend the money. You know what I mean? And it's not like she didn't have the money. She had means and then some, you know. I mean, she had money for a chandelier. So, you know, <laughs> surely you have a little bit of money for your poor little dog who seems to be passing out from whatever, right? But that, yeah, I can so get that. I can so see how in her mind back then was like, oh, babysitter's expensive. I'm going to save this money and just leave this baby here until I get back. So that means I must have been laying in my own feces and, and urine for at least more than necessary, right? I mean, if you're leaving a kid you know, eight hours by themselves while you go to work, what do you think is going to happen? That baby's going to poop and pee at least once. And, you know, all those hours and, and no food, you know. So, uh, yeah, and, and you didn't even bother to learn how to make a baby bottle. Yeah, that is narcissistic incubator. That is the classic picture. And mind you, folks, this woman all throughout my childhood, as I said in other videos, continuously threatened to throw me away, threatened to put me in an orphanage, threatened to, to you know, to just take, take institutionalize me. Again, to harm and do away with my life, okay? You may not physically be killed off, but, you know, if somebody manages to institutionalize you as a kid, your life is over with. You you know, you're basically in jail. And that's another thing. She would threaten jail when I was a, a preteen and teenager, too old to be put into an adoption thing or foster home, you know. Then she would threaten to, I'll get you locked up some kind of way. I'll find a way to get you locked up some kind of way. Again, has always had the intent to destroy my life, to do away with me, one way or another. If it isn't physically, then it is to soul murder me. And this is the classic picture of a narcissist incubator, folks. It's just no getting around it. No getting around it. <sighs> I tell you. I tell you. I remember one of the other things that she used to tell me all the time is that she had she had kept me and she had a child and she kept me because she knew that a child will never leave their mother. They will never leave and abandon their mother. 
So once again, Dr. Romani has a, a couple of videos, her and a couple of a German um, psychologists on YouTube have uh, actually said that that very thing is a common thing that narcissist incubators say and, and feel. It is their intention and motive behind actually keeping that child in their life because they feel that that is automatic lifetime narcissistic supply. Because this is something they say all the time that I want to have this child because a child will never leave me. A child will never abandon their mother, you see? So no matter what the mother does, that child will always stick to their mother. You see how, what I'm saying here? Do you understand what I'm trying to communicate to you folks? This is the classic picture of a narcissistic incubator. Classic. Think about it. An, a narcissist, they have to have they have to have narcissistic supply. If they don't, they feel empty and they feel lonely. And it is a, a, a perpetual emptiness and loneliness. And boredom too, by the way, because they're soulless. They have nothing in them. They always need to fill themselves with other people's energy and other people's personality and they go mirroring them and twinning them because they themselves have no identity. They don't know who they are because they're evil. They do evil stuff. It's all about them. So, you know, when you don't have something for other people in your heart, when you don't have a soul, but what, you know, you're gonna keep needing other people's admiration and, and attention, right? And, and you need them to admire you, to feel like somebody. Well, how much better than a brand new child that you can influence and brainwash to see you as whatever you wanna be seen as. So when the rest of the world comes crashing down on you and sees you for what you are, adults, i.e. adults, you always have that child. And you can infantilize that child to remain a child in many ways, mentally and psychologically, even after their body has already passed the bloom of youth. You can still manipulate that person. Many people never get away from incubators like this. Many people never escape it. They they're never, ever dare to actually see that. You see? So... Yeah, I definitely, I'm so glad my, my mental health facilitator and my counselor have uh, pushed me to go and write to these agencies and to find out more. You know, they, I wouldn't say push, but they've really encouraged me to, to do this. And, you know, uh, it, it's not the easiest thing, but um, I, like I said, I've got a great support system and I'm, I'm definitely working this in, in counseling and processing this. You know, but it basically just reaffirms so many things, folks. It reaffirms the fact that narcissistic incubators are never well-meaning. They don't mean well. They do not mean well. They don't mean you well. And if anything, they, they wish harm on you. They, they want to off you. They want to get rid of you. And this was a constant, constant thing that I had to endure. This undercurrent of, you're, you're not supposed to be here. You have no value. And um, I, I um, yeah, wow, wow. That's some scary stuff. That's some scary stuff. Threatening to commit murder, suicide. Whew. 
and and um, there were multiple visits that were done. So they tried to take me multiple times. Uh, there were multiple calls. It wasn't just one call. This was an ongoing thing. Um, I'm getting some more paperwork. So there's more information that I still don't know yet. There are pieces that I'm leaving out just for privacy's sake that are really, really bad. And I need to process these this, this additional information first before I speak to anybody about it. But it is very disturbing to me because I didn't know this about the person who gave birth to me. You know, I'm always a person that says, I want to know the truth. I want to know. I'm a digger. I dig for information. I eat information for breakfast. You know, some people have cravings for pizza or donuts or whatever. I have cravings for solid, interesting, or even new and novel information relevant to, to me and what I'm doing and living. Right? And when it comes to something like this, I want to know, I want to, I want to know the truth. And, um, you got to be careful what you wish for, you know, because you just might get it. That's a lesson I'm learning every day. The more mature I get in life, the more, the, the more time passes, the more experience, the more birthdays that pass. The more and more I realize the wisdom of that saying. Be careful, folks. Be careful. Be careful what you wish for. Because you just might get it. I don't regret going down this path. But it sure don't make it any easier for me to deal with this in the process. I want people to know if you're listening and you can relate to this, you find yourself in a similar situation, understand that these people have always been this way. This has nothing to do with you and who you are. It has nothing to do, it does not take anything away from who you are. It, you are not at fault. It is not your fault. This is their sickness. This is their sickness. You are sick if you're threatening to commit suicide over someone, over CPS coming to investigate and wanting to take your child away because you leave your child alone for hours and hours. Your infant child alone. You don't even know how to make a, you don't even know how to really feed this baby. You haven't even bothered to figure out how to feed this baby. But you can be bothered to, to figure out how to feed some damn fish. <laughs> and then these people want to cry on a forum somewhere about how cold and cruel their sons and daughters are and how they've been cut off and how could they do this and they have no idea why whatsoever oh no i have no idea why my cruel 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 son has cut me off i have done everything for him i sacrificed my whole life I sacrificed my life for my children, and this is what they do to me. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, Lord. Oh, Jehovah. Shut up. Shut the hell up. You don't give two fucks other than how it looks to society. <laughs> And, and, and now you're old and sick and need somebody. <laughs> and you can't get nobody to pay you any mind unless you shell out a few dollars. But you can't get, can't get your own flesh and blood. Nothing. Hey, there's not enough money in the world that you could give that person to ever want to bother with you. Hmm. And there's plenty of other folks out there like that. Now, some people do have a price. Don't get me wrong now. You can be a complete nasty evil narc 
and there'll be somebody that'll give you the time of day, but you're going to have to pay to play. Yeah, I, you know, they might not tell you all right, but, you know, the dynamics of that interaction and transaction always end up in money and resources being forked over. Okay, okay. I have never had to pay anybody to be my friend. You don't want to be my friend? Be free. Be free of me. Bye-bye. See you later, Gator. Wish you well. Wish you all the best. Okay? Hey, I don't take it personal. Business is business. Okay? We don't all match. Just like in the business world, folks. You know, you can have a tractor supply company. And then you have a medical supply company. Okay? And tractor supply company can't do anything with medical supplies. Right? So they're not a good match. Can be the best medical supply company out there, man. But... If they get together and try to do a business deal, it's not going to work. It's not going to be fair. It's not going to be even. It's not going to be a good match. And it's the same way with people. Not everyone is meant to be in your life. Okay? And I'm an equal opportunity friend, but I'm also equal opportunity setting boundaries and, you know, setting people free. Removing myself from their life. Okay, I will do that. And you have to. If you have not had to remove yourself from at least one or two people's lives in your lifetime, you haven't had, you've had, you haven't known enough people. You need to get out more. Okay, I'm just here to tell you. And I don't mean like really extreme where you're like shutting them, but you just have to keep them at arm's length. You know, when you see them say, oh, hey, how you doing? Okay, did you have a good weekend? Okay, all right, then well, you know, I'll see you later. Gotta get, gotta go. <laughs> you don't have to be rude to them. You don't have to be nasty or harbor any kind of hostility or resentment. You know, people are people. And most people would get on each other's nerves depending on, you know, all kinds of situations. Health, um, you know, time, stress. You know what I'm saying? Distraction. It's how it is. But then there are some dangerous people, okay? And dangerous is when... They want to harm you. When they are out, they have intentions to harm you. They will harm you just for their own ego. That threat was all narcissistic ego. That threat was not in the attempt that, that threat did not have the intention to protect an innocent child. No. That, this hooker, this narc hooker was going to have me kill, going to grab me and jump out of a window and kill me off. Not even before I ever had a chance at life, a good chance at life. You see, because it was for her benefit. She couldn't stand the idea of having me removed and taken away from her. Not out of love, you know, and protection from mother, you know, a motherly love and protection, you know. No, it was all about her. She was just going to kill herself, you know, and, oh, well, there's going to be a, a child, a motherless child, or just kill me right along with it. Instead of saying, well, damn, I'm in a predicament, but I'm going to do everything I can to get my child back home and safe under me. I mean, if she ever was to be a safe mother, which she never was. I mean, come on now. You're not a safe mother if you're threatening CPS workers to grab that child and jump out of a window and do a murder-suicide. That is not safe, folks, okay? And anybody, any of you sitting there thinking it, it might, oh, well, it's not that bad, or, you know, maybe she was depressed, get the flying fuck out of here with that shit, okay? Because too many people follow through on that, okay? And once, once it's done, you can't undo it. So that is not safe, okay? That is outright dangerous, okay? dangerous. We're, we're beyond toxic, okay? There's a lot of toxic people out there. Like I said, you got to keep some people at arm's length. You don't have to completely not talk to them. Sometimes you have to deal with them, like on, at work or in other settings, <laughs> excuse me, you know, and you can be cordial and you can gray rock. You gray rock, detach, distance, gray rock, detach, you know, keep your, your words up to a minimum, one word responses, you know, still treat the person with dignity, 
but just, you know, keep, keep as much of yourself away mentally, emotionally, physically, psychically as you can, you know, and, and try to get from around them as quick as you can, whatever you have to do, do, and then get away from them. Don't hang around and you know what I mean? But some people you have to completely cut out of your life and keep it that way because they do not mean you well. They have always been sick. I have never, ever, ever thought to do murder-suicide. Now, when I was a teenager, yes, I was suicidal because of what I was having to endure at home. I was very suicidal, but I have never thought to actually bring somebody else into that. No. No, no, no. I've never wished death on anybody, no matter how horrible the abuse that I went through. I have never, ever wished death on anyone. Remember, I said I had recordings. I had recordings of certain people. And it was really a shock to see what people really thought about me. It was really, really a shock what people really wanted to do to me. Recordings, it, it's not second or third party sources. It is directly from the horse's mouth, folks. I still won't go into detail about those recordings But like I said, I, I am just glad my counselor and also my uh, psychologist, I have a psychologist and an LMFT that I work with. And um, I'm glad that they both encouraged me to go down this path. And I, I know that we'll have uh, quite a bit of work to do on this. You know, because that's scary. It is It is scary. It's scary to think what could have happened. It's scary to think what could have happened. And this very incubator here, like I said, all throughout my childhood, she would threaten to institutionalize me one way or another, either to give me up for adoption, to put me in a, in a foster care, you know, to just, you know, get this, let the, let the state get me, just to put me in the system. You know, and she would threaten this. I'd be, you know, four starting, um, like I said, I remember these from three to four or five, six years old, all the way through until, um, you know, I was too old to be put in foster care. I, I'd be like in my teens. And then it was, you know, I'd, I'd get you locked up some kind of way, it, you know, and this was over normal things that kids do. Like I didn't want to wash dishes. Okay. So I would be threatened to be given up for adoption if I didn't wash dishes or if I didn't clean up after myself, okay? No kid ever wants to clean up after themselves. I, you know what I'm saying? This is normal stuff that children do. And when I would talk back, you know, especially when I became a, a preteen and teenager, uh, and, you know, I'm, as you know, I'm uh, quite loquacious and uh, I'm quite perceptive. And I do enjoy calling out sometimes calling out people here and there, you know, I mean, uh, so you can imagine I was quite sophisticated in my, in, in the way that I was already intellectually thinking and processing things. And when you're dealing with a narc like that, you know, um, that's really, really dangerous for the, for that child, that teenager. So that's when I would be threatened to be locked up some kind of way. Mm -hmm. And I would have the beatings and then you know, she would instigate the, the sexual abuse, you know, she would rile him up and um, the, uh, the beatings with the sexual connotation where I would have to be uh, forced to completely be naked, you know, and, and I'm already in my teens, by the way. Yeah. And, um, you know, just beaten with just horrible belt buckles, the metal part of the belt buckles, switches. I mean, I still have... Uh, on my inner thigh, I still have um, hypertrophic scarring from a laceration 
that was so deep I could see the white meat of my flesh. And I was 10 years old. I was only 10 years old. Yeah, fifth grade. And uh, the reason I got that beating was because I stole some quarters for lunch. Um, they, they, they weren't always leaving me money for lunch. So there were days that I'd be so hungry in school, I'd feel like I'd pass out. And, you know, I, I would be hungry all day. I couldn't really think straight, you know, and then I'd go home. And, you know, I'm all alone. No, no supervision of adults or anything like that. Making sure that I have lunch money, that I've got all my school books packed. Or, you know, I, I was so jealous of other kids who actually had parents that took them to school and did all that, you know, and had breakfast there. So I've never had any of that. So um, I, I, uh, I went into the step person's coin collection. He had this coin collection and he had some coins that are not all that common, but he had a bunch of regular quarters and uh, dollar coins. So I would go in there and take some coins, the, the, you know, the regular coins. I knew the difference between the, you know, the collector's coins and the regular coins. I would take some of the regular coins for lunch money. And um, I guess after a week, he, he came in barging one evening after he came home from work and said, did you, take, did you take my money out of my coin collection? And I was so afraid because I knew, I knew this man was going to kill me. I mean, I actually thought he was going to end up killing me. I was so afraid of him. I, I, I almost peed on myself. And... Um, Despite that, I told them the truth. I said, yes, I did take some of those coins because you didn't leave me lunch money anymore. And I was so hungry at school. And that's all he needed to know because then he forced me to become completely naked. And, and mind you, this incubator is sitting right there and she's watching. You know, she's feeding off of it like it's her favorite TV show. She is just feeding off of this pain that this child is going to be gone. You know, the pain, humiliation, and damage. That's what you get for talking back to me. That's what you get for not washing the dishes when I tell you what, when I tell you to do them. That's what you get. For not cleaning up after yourself. You see, any healthy parent would have said, listen, let's sit down and talk about this, okay? Because obviously this kid isn't a bad kid. It's not taking the money to just steal and, and frivolously because there weren't candy. It's taking money because your ass is not leaving lunch money. This kid is not eating, is not able to eat lunch at school, okay? So a, a normal healthy parent would have been like, okay, listen, let's talk. I understand why you did this, okay? But next time, let's communicate. Let me know. And I'm going to make sure that I have your lunch money every morning, you know? Let's work together on this. That would have been a loving, a parent that would have loved that child, right? But see, these are not those kinds of parents. You know, this man had a sexual tension. He needed some kind of perverted gratification. And because I was not a, a, a submissive child, okay? I mean, I was still a child, but, you know, I I knew enough to know to just tell, 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 tell everybody, anybody. And I knew to never, ever stop because that was going to prevent it from being worse than if I kept silent. So uh, it went as far as it did, and it was too far, way too far. But I believe, truly believe, because of me and my, my, the spirit, the strength of spirit that I've always had, you would have had to kill me to shut me up. You would have had to physically kill me to shut me up. And see, at some point, that path was laid out years and years later. That path was laid out and attempted. 
just like it was attempted at the very beginning of ever since I was born. Ever since I was born, this incubator has attempted to destroy my life in one way or another, all for her own selfish, 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 wretched, wretched, wretched ego. All right, folks, what do you think about that? Can you relate to that? Can you relate to that? I tell you, it's a lot of people that might be sitting back saying, I can't believe that about her. She's such a sweet lady. Uh-huh. Don't they say that about a lot of serial killers? Oh, he was just the nicest person. He was so helpful. Him? Remember Tita Puente? The nice little sweet elderly grandmother that took in everybody and cooked for people and seemed like a sweet little lady. And then they found bodies and bodies and bodies up under them rose bushes. Little old grandma. Mm -hmm. She was collecting them checks. She was one of them caregivers, too. You know, for old people in hospice and stuff. Yes, a lot of them narcs out there in them old folks' homes. I tell you what. I will not, I wouldn't want to live under nothing like that. You know what I mean? But, um, yeah. What can I say about that? <sighs> I tell you, there's more coming out, though. There's more coming out on, I'm getting some more um, documents sent to me. But um, let's take a look at what somebody else had to say here. You know, I... Uh, one of the things that Dr. Ramani and a lot of these mental health folks on YouTube and even my own mental health uh, professionals that I work with, they, they talk about how narcissism and narcissists have a perpetual feeling of emptiness and loneliness. It is like a, a, a hole. They have a hole where the soul should be. And it is a hole, a void, a never ending void that they constantly need to fill with, with, they have no ability, like a healthy person has the ability to self-validate and, you know, they have a soul, they have a conscience, they have empathy, they have compassion. These people don't have that. They're antisocial. They don't really like people and they, they resent people around them because they need people. We all need each other, right? Well, they resent that. They actually hate people because they know they need people. They need them for narcissistic supply and validation. And it is this twisted back and forth uh, hate. I won't say love because a narcissist is incapable of true love. In their mind, it, what they translate as love is really codependence and addiction. You know, that's what they translate as loving someone, being codependent on that person for narcissistic supply and admiration and attention. You know, being addicted. Codependence is addiction, folks, okay? It goes hand in hand. And, and narcissists are codependent. You know, it's built in with the narcissism and they seek out codependent people. They, they, they thrive on codependent people, especially if they're in a one-down position. Those are the ones that they want to be around the most because then they have leverage. They can control and manipulate and do all these things that they need because they need your energy. They need every last drop of your soul. Every last drop and then some. And you know what? It still won't be enough. These people will cause you sicknesses. They will cause you mental illness because they're sick you can't tell me this woman was not sick from the beginning and she's never went to a counselor ever ever never 
does not believe there's anything wrong with her, does not believe she ever needs to go. And isn't that the classic narc? Is that not the classic narcissist? Is that not the classic antisocial personality disordered individual? They don't think they ever need to go to a counselor. They don't think anything's wrong with them. No, 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 no. It is the other person. These people have the nerve to call me crazy, to call me sick. Okay, and I know we all want to call each other crazy and narcissist and all that, but baby, it's in black and white over here. It's on the it's on the documents. This is not just me saying things. It's right here. And I like I said, I got it from the horse's mouth itself. And I still got recordings. If I ever get forget. All I got to do is go back and play those recordings to myself again. All I have to do is go back and read these documents. Go back into my file cabinet and read these documents to, to remind me. If I ever, which I don't, but if I ever shall need that, I got it right here, folks. Now, some of us may not have all of that. You know, I'm all for verification, documentation, research. So... I have more than the average person because that's just how I work. You know, I use the scientific process with things sometimes. I'm not a scientist, but I like to use verification, tangible verification. When I deliver something or when I make a decision, I, ha I make that decision uh, an educated, sound decision. And I increase the chances of it being the right decision by getting things like this, by documentation documented facts, facts, not assumptions, not hearsay, not likelihoods, but facts. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to be going through the gambit of emotions for sure. You know, I'm, I'm just a regular person like everyone else. I can put on that mask of being okay and being strong and all of that. But, you know, we all go through that gambit. We all are going to go through that gambit of emotion. Any normal, healthy person is going to go through it. So I'm I'm here for it. I'm, 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 re I'm willing and able to sit through whatever comes emotionally. Hell, I've been doing it all these years. You know what I'm saying? So, and like I said, it's a, mo a lot of this so far. Now, there was there's some points that I still have the process that I haven't really spoke to anyone on because I'm not ready to speak on those things to anyone yet. But uh, other than my counselors. But uh, together, we will process that. And once I process that and integrate that, and have my own significant insights that I may at some point share that in the future. I don't know. It all depends. I think it's time for a little break right now. Battery 90%. Connected to Galaxy A715G. And after the break, we'll talk a little bit more. We were good, we were gold, kind of dream that can't be so. We were right, till we weren't, built a home and watched it burn. Mm, I didn't want to leave you, I didn't want to lie, started to cry.
cherry red Master roses that you lay No remorse, no regret I forgive every word you say smoke break not the cigarette smoke the other kind <laughs> all right thank you for tuning in now and in the future the random channel where we have homegrown content none of that influencer bullshit you know what i mean okay i'm sorry i don't mean to label it as bullshit you know i know they're it's a hustle they're making money right and some of these people are making real serious bank goodness gracious <laughs> Well, I'm not opposed to it, you know, but we're just not doing that on this channel. This is organic, homegrown, non-GMO, plant-based, um, eco-friendly, you know, fat-free, <laughs> unrehearsed. Uh, I don't have sponsors that are influencing me to present certain things to you in a certain way. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I don't need anything from you. I don't need any money from you. I don't care if I'm living on Skid Row completely homeless. I will not be asking you for any dough. You don't need to give me no money. I'm good. I'm going to be good regardless. I don't care if I'm living in the back of a van. I don't care if I'm living in a mansion or anything in between. I'm still going to be good because I've made a decision to be good. You see what I'm saying? Despite some of the truly fucked upness of life, despite some of the horrible things that I've experienced early, early, early before I was even an adult, I still feel like I've had a good life. Because to me, a good life isn't always all good. Okay, you got some horrible stuff. No one escapes a suffering. You know, even if people aren't abused as a child and haven't gone through any of that, that does not absolve them from any suffering because life is suffering. Isn't that what the, the Buddha says? Life is suffering. Life is suffering. There, you will suffer. You will experience pain. You will experience betrayal at some point. Even if you have the best family, the best childhood, all the money, you had good money, you went to good schools, your parents loved you and nurtured you and did everything, you had a really wonderful childhood, you met the love of your life, and, and you know, there are still painful things, even with the things you want. That's why I always say, be careful what you wish for. You just might get it. 
And then what you want to do? Let's say, for example, you know, a lot of people say, I want to get married and have children. Okay. Sounds like a wonderful life for some people. That, that, that's a dream, right? Uh, or some people say, I want to go, I want this job over here. Or I want a UCLA law degree. Okay. You know, I want, I want, to, I want to have a big uh, 3,000 square foot home in, in X place. I want to have a, a UCL law degree. I want to have privileged connections. Well, guess what? There's a lot of suffering and pain you, you need to be getting ready for. Okay? A lot, because nothing's free in this life, right? Something found, nothing is free. You're going to pay some kind of way. You're going to pay with your energy, your blood, your sweat, your tears, emotionally, some, some kind of way. Money, you're not paying any money. You're going to pay some other way. Nothing is free. You're going to pay some other way. Because you're going to have to go through a lot of work. Having children, childbirth for women, that, that's very painful. I don't know anything about it, but I know enough to know that that is just, oh my God, that must be excruciating. <laughs> okay. So in the overall picture, yes, it's a beautiful thing, and these are things you want and love, right? But within that is still suffering, and that's what life is. You have a lot of suffering. So the way that I look at it is, despite of the horrible, unfair things, I still feel happy and joy. You can't take my joy away. You can't take my happiness away. You can't take my soul and who I am away. You can't do it. You can't buy it from me. You can't take it from me. All you can do is do is, is inflict violence and abuse and possibly kill me off. But then you still haven't taken my happiness away. You see folks, because I know who I am. Do you know who you are? Because these type of people, they want to take that away from you. Because <laughs> they don't know who they are. Narcs don't have any sense of identity. They, like I told you, it is an empty, perpetually empty void. So folks, I'm over at Cora one day, one fine day. Actually, Cora sends me these notifications. So I got this. Uh, I don't know how. I think I signed up to some kind of groups. I'm in a lot of different forums and groups when I research different topics, including mental health and narcissism and things of that nature, right? So the question here that I, uh, I saw the other day is it a common feeling for a narcissist to feel empty inside, lonely and depressed? Yes, it is a common feeling. It is one of the signs, you know, ignoring the signs as Kaya Shimon says, ignoring the signs, they're ignoring the signs, you know, the writing is there, the writing's on the wall. You know, not like Ace of Base that says, I saw the sign. Nope, they're not trying to see the signs. But that perpetual empty feeling inside and that loneliness and depressedness, that's what you get for being a narc. <laughs> that's what you get for being a narc. That's what you get. For the stuff you do. We all got to pay. We all got karma to pay. Nobody escapes karma. And we all make mistakes. But some of us make more extreme mistakes than others. And I think in the overall big picture, you know, in this universe and cosmos, we all eventually learn. Some of us will be held back and stunted in that. And narcissists, I think, may have to have trillions of lifetimes of, of, of emptiness and loneliness and depressedness until maybe there's a, a glimmer of light there. But, you know, don't hold your breath for sure. It ain't going to happen in this lifetime. Like I said, trillions. 
trillions, not millions, not billions, but trillions or even more. So, yeah, it's a common feeling, but I want you to take a look at what somebody responded here. Hold on a minute. Okay, so I hope you can read that here. Control plus. It says here, in my experience, hold on, let me try to make it bigger. It says, in my experience, those so afflicted are often drowning in anxiety, emptiness, depression, and a constant quest for attention slash admiration. They wear many masks, the first being kindness slash helpfulness in order to gain such admiration and a gateway to ultimate control of the current supply. There are many accurate and candid memories and examples of narcissistic relationships here on this forum. Read them and gain solace as I have. <clears throat> this is why I do this. That's why I read different forums and things like this. My concise observation and experience that I can personally relate is that a narcissist is but a shell of a person, like snakeskin shed after the snake outgrows it. There's ice water in the veins and a block of concrete where the heart should be. They will drown in their own pit of poison, self-made, as they cast aside one person after another, incapable of learning anything about caring about anyone. Let's pause on that for a second. Let's marinate on that for a minute. Hmm. You see that? There's ice water in the veins and a block of concrete where the heart should be. This is why I, I, I believe in cutting certain people off from life. You, this is that's not even human. Keeping such a person around is a guarantee to destruction, pain, unnecessarily suffering, and, and, and all of the other bad things. So yeah, um, I've got the background here of uh, one of the videos of a, a, a narc incubator, Karen, that's just basically lost it in the middle of a McDonald's drive through uh, you know, just showing her hind, like literally showing her ass and not getting out of the way, cars honking at her. I think they probably called the police on her, but uh, this is what happens to some of these narcs is that when they, as they get older, they get worse to where, you know, now nobody will fool with them. You know, they've, they've driven away their own sons and daughters. And now it, it just comes closing in on them because it's a mental sickness. It's a, it's sickness, just plain sick. And it's not the kind of sickness where it's not that person's fault because they make those decisions. You can make yourself sick too. Narcs make themselves sick, and this one here made herself so sick to where she just lost it and is, you know, doing her Karen thing in the middle of a drive through for some narc supply because literally nobody will give her the time of day. Has driven off her own offspring, own adult sons and daughters won't, you know, they've cut her off for years since decades. And this is what she's ended up as. They put, they then put her in the crazy, what do they call it? The crazy place, psychiatric uh, institution. Yeah. They had to put her in a, in a mental institution. Get a load of that. Isn't that something? Threatening to institutionalize their own child since the very beginning, you know, and then they end up in their old age being institutionalized one way or another. Hmm. I tell you, that karma show is a bitch. Shoal is a bitch. How they say it in Alabama? Shoal is a bitch. Shoal is. <laughs> I 
I don't wish any bad on anyone, but I sure don't feel sympathy when, when some people have, you know, get what they, what's coming to them because they worked hard to get it. It's like one of my other friends says, everyone working is going to get a paycheck. You know what I mean? That's the universal law. Every one of us is working. And I'm not just talking about a J-O-B necessarily here. I'm talking about living life. How you live it. How are you living? The way that you're living, you're working. You're working this universe. If you're alive, if you've been born, you're working. Little infants, little kids, we all are working. Now, kids, you know, like I said, we don't have the brain power to make decisions to be responsible for ourselves as an adult would. So all of the adults are working. All of us adults are working one way or another. We're living and we are getting a paycheck. We are getting our own karma, every one of us. And sometimes, you know, you might not be aware your karma is instant, whether, whether it's apparent or not to you or other people around you. And some people can, can be fooled, you know. They look at how their, their houses or their, their expensive bank accounts, their big bank accounts and expensive cars they drive, and they tell themselves, oh, you know, I'm living good. Nothing's happening to me. I guess I didn't do anything wrong. You know, I didn't go to jail. You know, nobody can prove I did A, B, and C, so I'm good, right? Okay. And then that emptiness and loneliness and soullessness keeps knocking in the back still here that perpetual void so yeah she couldn't deal with that emptiness i mean that void you know anymore it was all closing in on her and <laughs> she just took a shit right there in front of <laughs> the car in mcdonald's drive through and got arrested they done put her in a in a i think they put her in a good place though you know they gave her some meds they 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 actually had to, um, you know, she was really showing out. You can see the other videos that I have up of her. And they had to go out there. You know how they get them them, them darts? They had to dart her like a bull at the rodeo or like a, a wild wildebeest out in the wild. You know, this is a Karen in the wild. Karen's gone wild. And a lot of these Karens are narc incubators, you know. There's a reason why they go wild and feral out here in this world. This one is a feral one. You know, she used to be able to hide it a lot better. She used to be at the Kingdom Hall Church and all of that. And, you know, put on a mask of gentleness and, and generousness and kindness and this and that. And, you know, when when the people started seeing more and more through her to, to the point where her own offspring cut her off. I mean, that was just like the beginning of the end. She was just, she just could never recover from it, really, you know, and... Here she is, just taking a big ass shit right there, you know, in the public, just, to, just, just, you know. But hey, you know, that's neither here nor there over here for us. <laughs> oh, Jehovah, honey, this is Sister Billy Bertha May Smith coming to you live from the Kingdom of Boo, and I just have to uh, interject here, honey. All these ungrateful children, honey, all of these ungrateful children think that they. They, they are entitled to their own free life, honey. You are not free, honey. These people gave birth to you, honey. If it wasn't for them, honey, you wouldn't be here on this earth, honey. So you need to just let them do whatever they want to do to you, honey, and abuse you. You know what? They're incapable of abusing you, honey, if they gave birth to you, honey. Because if somebody gives birth to you automatically, that absolves them of anything and everything they do from then on, honey. It's like that Baptist church, honey. Once saved, always saved. Okay, honey? So you can be out here gambling, drinking, adultifying, adultery. You can be out here stealing and then ripping people off and taking shits in the middle of a, uh, excuse me, Jehovah, I'm sorry about that cursing, honey, but taking a big crap in front of people in the McDonald's drive through and showing out, and um, you will always be saved with the Baptist church, honey. There's nothing you can do to unsave yourself, honey. You are good to go, honey. <laughs> Too bad it don't work in the Jehovah Witness, honey, because you got to constantly work to, to, to stay saved and get saved, and maybe you get saved. You know, you can do everything right, but that ain't no guarantee, honey. It all depends on Jehovah's mood that day, honey, so just make sure it ain't when he's got PMS, boo, okay? I'm just here to tell you, just don't get him on a bad mood, honey, okay? Because he will destroy you at Armageddon, honey. Mm -hmm. Okay.
Anyway, honey, this sister right here, honey, <laughs> her only son refuses to talk to her, honey. Did you hear that? He had cut her off since over a decade, honey. And you know what they say about him, honey? She has said that he is clinically insane, honey. That he was diagnosed with insanity, honey. And I was like, really? And then she was like, yeah, that's why that's why he don't talk to her, because he's insane, and he's accusing them of the worst kinds of things, talking about he was abused by her and that step person. And I was like, really, honey? And they was like, yeah, and she's saying that. That's all a lie, honey. And, and you know, she is so nice, and she went and bought us a big dinner while she was telling us it's all a lie. And we was like, hmm, is it really so, honey? Because... I don't remember him being all that crazy. I mean, I know that, you know, he had certain lifestyle changes. You know what I'm saying, honey? But that ain't really crazy, honey. Just people don't understand that, honey. And I don't think it's all that bad. He ain't a bad person. He out here living his life like everybody else. He ain't out here looking like a damn Makilla gorilla like she is, honey. Mm -hmm. So I don't know about her because a lot of these Jehovah Witness, honey, you know, they, they got a good face at the Kingdom Hall, boo, but behind closed doors, honey, ooh, Lord Jehovah, it's a whole other story, honey. I know it, honey. Oh, Jehovah, honey. And you know what? Uh, if she was really all that, Jehovah would have not had her out there in that drive through acting out and, and showing out, honey. I believe she's lying, honey. And you know, you know, brother, brother so-and-so said that too. Brother so-and-so said that he told her long ago, honey, she need to treat her child better and spend some time with the child because it's going to affect that child's relationships when it gets over and all, and she wouldn't do it, honey. And they were saying she was very neglectful because that poor child was calling everybody seven, eight times a day alone at home. And, and you know, nobody, nobody could really help that kid. You know, they was busy with their own kids and you know it was just a, a, a it was just really sad but nobody was doing nothing either honey they was just waiting on Jehovah to fix it honey and Jehovah never got around to fixing that one boo okay so uh I guess he fixed it himself by just cutting her off honey mm -hmm. <laughs> Jehovah honey glory be honey glory be well, honey, that's uh, all I got to say about that, honey. You know, I believe in honoring your mother and father, honey, but I don't believe in, in letting them just do you any kind of way, even if they are Jehovah, Jehovah Witness, honey. That don't mean nothing. Just because they sitting in the kingdom hall with their suits and dresses, honey, and playing the part don't mean Jehovah. Uh, Jehovah don't say what they do behind closed doors, honey. They might have you and me food, honey, but they ain't going to fool Jehovah and karma, boo. Mm -hmm. Ain't that what worldly people call karma? Mm -hmm. I call it Jehovah, honey. Jehovah, not Jehovah, but Jehovah H. God, boo. Jehovah H. God. And the H stand for Henry, boo. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jehovah, honey. Yeah, I've been changed. Have been changed.